It was a seven-year mission that created a four-year mission to be the anti-Star Trek, a showcase for the mastery of technical abilities that no one else in the galaxy was capable of, the direct result of mixing a little bit of dino DNA into your Ninja Turtles. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of Farscape. Thank you to Factor for sponsoring this video. Click the link in the description below and use code GALAXY50 for 50% off your first box today. The holidays are approaching and that means more stuff to do and even less time to do it in. More people, more food, and even less money because you keep buying action figures every time you go to the store to shop for the people on your list. Maybe that's just me. Factor is here to take some of the stress from the planning and preparation off your plate and put it on a different plate. Choose from more than 35 weekly flavor-packed, fresh, never-frozen meals that support a healthy lifestyle delivered right to your door and ready to eat in two minutes. Looking for special occasion meals during the holidays? Level up with Gourmet Plus options prepared to perfection by chefs and ready to eat in record time with premium ingredients like broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. And with Factor, you can rest assured you're making a sustainable choice because Factor offsets 100% of their delivery emissions and source 100% renewable electricity for their production sites and offices. Factor is now owned by HelloFresh, and with a wider array of meal plans to choose from, there's something for everyone. It's easy to switch between the brands to make your meal planning even easier. Head to Factor75.com or click the link below and use code GALAXY50 to get 50% off your first Factor box today. That's Factor75.com, code GALAXY50, and thanks again to Factor. Farscape is a live-action science fiction television series that aired 88 episodes over four seasons from March of 1999 through March of 2003. Produced by the Jim Henson Company, it was Sci-Fi Channel's first original series, one of their most expensive at the time, and with the highest rate of puppets per minute. John Crichton is an astronaut scientist who has a theory about gravitational acceleration in outer space, and the time has come to test it. Utilizing a spacecraft designed specifically for the mission, he embarks on the kind of dangerous mission that changes history, charting a new course for science, technology, and the future. As he races across the outer limits of Earth's atmosphere, the experiment takes an unexpected turn. His ship Farscape 1 is overcome by a gravitational wave anomaly that opens a wormhole catapulting him across space and time. He finds himself amidst an ongoing conflict between unknown alien species with incredible spacecraft, weaponry, and technology far beyond those of the Earth he left behind. He's also in space jail. A man out of time and space, he's become a target of the ruthless peacekeepers after accidentally killing their leader's brother. Pursued across the galaxy, Crichton is going to have to make friends with a diverse cadre of felonious aliens and their stolen sentient ship to survive long enough to maybe, one day, find a way back to Earth. Brian Henson took control of the Jim Henson Company after his father, Jim Henson, passed away in 1990. Jim had been negotiating a merger with Disney that fell apart for two main reasons. One, taxes related to Jim's death reduced the company's value relative to its debt, and two, one of the key assets Disney wanted to acquire, Jim Henson, was no longer available. Two years later, in 1992, Brian Henson started working on a project he hoped would showcase everything that the Jim Henson Company was capable of producing. He wanted to flex everything they had developed for movies like Dark Crystal, Labyrinth, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and the TV series Dinosaurs in one package. The initial seed of the idea was, as Henson put it, something like Star Wars, but on a weekly basis. In 1993, Henson recruited Rockne S. O'Bannon, who wrote the 1988 movie Alienation, episodes of Amazing Stories, the 1980s reboot of The Twilight Zone, and created Sequest DSV, to develop a new story. Together, Henson and O'Bannon worked to create what they thought of as the anti-Star Trek. Despite their personal love for the Trek franchise, Star Trek The Next Generation was exactly the opposite of what they wanted to make. They wanted to get away from Star Trek's formal structure, its military hierarchy of leadership, the reserved, sometimes literally robotic nature of the characters' emotions. They wanted a science fiction show that was primal, with unconstrained emotions. <laughs> Everybody loses their minds! <laughs> and Henson wanted it to get weird, with as many creatures as possible. O'Bannon loved that and went for as much diversity of style and scale as he could. Big aliens, complex aliens, characters that were half-human actors and half-alien prosthetics. Everybody's so creative! O'Bannon introduced the idea of a man out of time and space, the hero lost in a foreign land, a science fiction standard connecting characters like John Carter of Mars, Buck Rogers, and Flash Gordon, a regular person from our Earth thrust into the unknown, an avatar for 
viewers on these incredible adventures. Henson and O'Bannon cycled through different names as the show evolved. From Far Horizon to Space Chase, they settled on Farscape, a name that evoked both the idea of Crichton being on the other side of the galaxy and the narrative need to escape from the relentless pursuit of the Peacekeepers. In 1994, as Star Trek The Next Generation was airing its final season, Henson and O'Bannon took a crap ton of production art and O'Bannon's pilot episode script to the Fox Network to pitch the idea. Still a young network, but on a rapid upward trajectory, thanks to the success of The Simpsons, Fox was looking for new programming. Tonight, civilization will come to an end. Hey, accidents happen. Whoops, a new comedy premieres tonight. Fox read the script and liked it so much they asked for three more scripts and even more production art. Henson and O'Bannon returned to pitch again and again, each time working their way up the ladder of people who couldn't officially say yes to greenlighting the series. At the time, Fox was in the process of consolidating their East and West Coast primetime television development offices. The West Coast office was working with Henson and O'Bannon on Farscape. The East Coast office was working on a series called Space Above and Beyond. The final decision was made after Henson and O'Bannon pitched Farscape directly to Fox owner Rupert Murdoch himself. Spoiler alert, Murdoch passed on Farscape, greenlighting Space Above and Beyond one season 23 episodes instead. Cost was a huge factor in Fox passing on Farscape. While there would be some computer-generated effects, most of the visual effects work was going to be practical, physical effects. Building original alien worlds, spaceships, and all of the incredible characters that the Creature Shop was designing was expensive. Henson and O'Bannon attempted to sell Farscape directly to networks for syndication, working one market at a time, when they got the opportunity to pitch to the Sci-Fi Channel. Launched in 1992, Sci-Fi was built on reruns from all over the television science fiction library. Cartoons like Transformers, Robotech, Bionic 6, and Galaxy High School, TV series like Sequest, DSV, Alien Nation, Amazing Stories, Star Trek, My Secret Identity, Sliders, Doctor Who, and the Linda Hamilton Beauty and the Beast. That's two different shows, Doctor Who and the Linda Hamilton Beauty and the Beast. Can you imagine? Thanks to a management change, Sci-Fi was making the move to original programming. After hearing the pitch for the series, Sci-Fi ordered 13 episodes encouraging Henson to make it as weird as possible because Sci-Fi did not want a kid's show. While Henson and O'Bannon felt liberated by the creative freedom, it left them with a new problem. How do they actually make this show? And what is it actually gonna cost? Everything about Farscape was driven by the budget. While the 13 episode purchase included a substantial penalty for sci-fi if they canceled before the order was complete, they still had to make the show as economical as possible. A single episode of Farscape was around a million dollars, cheaper than an episode of Next Generation at the time, but not sustainable without a reliable network partner. And so production was moved to the much more budget-friendly shooting locations in Australia. Thankfully, once episodes were actively being produced, Sci-Fi placed an order for an additional nine episodes to allow for a full season of 22. The move to Australia meant that, other than Ben Browder, who played John Crichton, nearly the entire cast and crew were from Australia and New Zealand, something that both Henson and O'Bannon credit for the full weirdness of the show, with O'Bannon saying, quote, Australians are just incredibly wild individuals and they embraced the insanity of the show. So you got sucked down a wormhole and shot to the other side of the universe? Well, here's your helpful guide. Run, scoot, vamoose! If that doesn't work, introduce yourself. My name's John. John. Remember, aliens are very friendly and will greet you in many ways, like the tongue whip, the spit, the old-fashioned canoodle, canoodle, the friendly welcome flip, or just plain laugh at you. So sit back and enjoy the food, and if you get the chance, run, man, run like the wind, man! Farscape starts September 15th at 8. Leave it away on YTV. Farscape kicked off in March of 1999, living up to its weird ideals, looking like nothing else on television, flying in the face of the retired Star Trek, the cancelled Space Above and Beyond, the cancelled Babylon 5, and even Stargate SG-1, which was heading into its third season. But even with a full season order of 22 episodes and potential penalties, Farscape wasn't immune to the threat of cancellation from the very beginning. In the middle of season one, the production frantically searched for a new home as they were kicked out by a much bigger budget production, Star Wars Episode II, Attack of the Clones. Thankfully, another studio was available in Australia, as the cost to move back to the U.S. would have been prohibitive. Despite several scheduling changes by Sci-Fi, the team at Henson was able to get into a rhythm, the show established its foundation, and the fan base grew. Meanwhile, outside production, the Jim Henson Company was in a state of flux. In 2000, Jim Henson's five children, who were all adults, sold the company to EM.TV, a media and merchandising company in Germany, for $680 million. 
EM.TV immediately sold off pieces to recoup some of that cost. Children's Television Workshop, the company that had been responsible for Sesame Street since its debut in 1969, was able to purchase back the rights to all of the Sesame Street's characters, which they still own today. Sci-Fi ultimately picked up Farscape Season 2 before the end of Season 1. Production worked ahead knowing that they had at least 22 more episodes of story to tell. But 2001's Season 3 wasn't a guarantee as Sci-Fi began to finance more original programming, the budget for Farscape became a target. Ensign credits the fans for their efforts early on to engage with sci-fi in creative ways to make their feelings known whenever the threat of cancellation became too real. When sci-fi thought they needed to expand their audience beyond the typical male viewer, the current female fans let their presence be known with a campaign known as Brascape, wherein they mailed bras to the sci-fi offices. Furthermore, the fans established SaveFarscape.com, a way to coordinate their lobbying efforts to keep the show on the air. Henson has stated that season three would not have happened without the fans' activism online and in the real world. Heading into 2002, Sci-Fi agreed to two more seasons, seasons four and five, which gave production a chance to breathe and set up longer storylines. It meant deeper, more complex character work and more dramatic resolutions. But later that year, citing declining ratings and, again, the high cost of production, Sci-Fi canceled Farscape, having aired only half the episodes in season four. And it was once again up to the fans to save the show. The cancellation was unceremoniously announced by Henson and O'Bannon during an online chat with fans, after which fans got to work to find alternative ways to fund the show with money from outside sci-fi and the Jim Henson Company. At the time, the Jim Henson Company was still owned by EM.TV, meaning that Brian Henson was no longer the decision maker at the top nor involved in negotiations in any way. The fate of Farscape was in the hands of executives at EM.TV and Sci-Fi Channel clouding production with uncertainty and helplessness. The season four finale ended with To Be Continued, which no one liked because it seemed like a wish more than a promise. Fans acted quickly, attempting to create their own crowdfunding efforts and exploring ways to bring in backers who could make larger contributions. Meanwhile, EM.TV put the Jim Henson Company back up for sale. Disney, Viacom, AOL, Time Warner, even Saban were all interested, but no deals were made. EM.TV was close to selling 50% of the company to a group of investors led by media entrepreneur Dean Valentine, but he was unable to secure funding. When EM.TV's finances worsened in 2003, the Henson family was able to repurchase the remains of the Jim Henson Company for $84 million. But that didn't solve the financing problems for Farscape. Henson once again credits the fans for doing the work to get Farscape back into production. It was the sustained effort to spread the word about the show that resulted in a backer with the means and desire to help. Henson said he got a call from a person who said, I would like to fund it. Two days later, Henson went to meet them and Farscape was back in production. Kind of. In October of 2004, Sci-Fi aired The Peacekeeper Wars, a two-episode miniseries to wrap up all the loose ends of season four and bring the series to a proper close. Fans held their collective breath and crossed their fingers, hoping that not only would the story deliver closure, but also that enough new fans would discover it and production would continue. Despite all the efforts to keep the show alive, the ratings were the ratings. And for the Peacekeeper Wars, they were consistent with the ratings when the series was canceled. At the end of the day, TV is a business and neither Sci-Fi nor the Jim Henson Company could justify the cost of the series without more viewers. Farscape was released on DVD and in 2011, all four seasons were released on Blu-ray. Neither release includes the Peacekeeper Wars two episode miniseries. In 2019, all four seasons and the Peacekeeper Wars were released on Amazon Prime Video. It was also released on Blu-ray again, this time including the Peacekeeper Wars. As of this video, a third Blu-ray set is scheduled for release this month, November of 2023 by Shout Studios. That said, you can stream it online at many of your favorite service providers. In 2000, Toy Vault began releasing a line of action figures in multiple scales. Two series allowed for versions of the characters in different outfits, including from specific episodes like Scorpius and the Hawaiian Shirt from the Crackers Don't Matter episode. In 2002, Red Lemon Studios released a Farscape video game for Windows. It's set during season one and features the voices of the actors from the series. The reviews were not good and no sequel was produced. <laughs> That same year, Alderac Entertainment released a Farscape role-playing game built on the D20 system. Reviews were good. It was nominated for multiple awards, Best Graphic Design, Best Layout, and Best D20 Game of 2003, and no sequel was produced. <laughs> Three Farscape novels expanded the universe outside the television series, House of Cards, Dark Side of the Sun, and Ship of Ghosts. A fourth was in the works, but was never published because the show was canceled. <laughs> In 2002, Jim Lee's Wildstorm Productions published a two-issue miniseries called War Torn. Six years later in 2008, long after the show had been canceled, Boom Studios published stories that take place after the Peacekeeper Wars. 
three, four issue miniseries between 2008 and 2009 that led into an ongoing series that ran 24 issues. After Farscape ended, Ben Browder and Claudia Black worked together again, this time on Stargate SG-1, a series which began two years prior to Farscape on Showtime, then moved to sci-fi in 2002 during Farscape's final season. As fans of Farscape, the writers included a few nods to Browder and Black's time on the show. In 2007, it was reported that Farscape was finally returning as a series of 10 webisodes. Webisodes, a portmanteau of web and isodes. Brian Henson and the entire Farscape fandom hoped that the webisodes would perform well enough to bring back a regular series or perhaps a feature film. Two years later, Henson said that they were still looking for webisode funding and that if the fans wanted to help out with that, eh, anyone? Anyone got any money? They want to make some Farscapes? Nobody? How about bras? Can we do that again? <laughs> In 2014, a new report suggested that a Farscape movie was in development. Four years later, in 2018, Brian Henson acknowledged that fan interest has never relented and that he is just as excited about getting it done as he has ever been. But it's complicated. The budget, the timing, the story. A movie might not be enough time to tell the story they want to tell. It might work better as a TV series again. As he put it, quote, sort of exactly like what we're doing in London right now with Dark Crystal. So there is the potential of doing something like that with Farscape. <laughs> Farscape was a highly innovative series whose influence can still be felt today. Writer, director, and current co-head of DC Studios, James Gunn, has admitted that the characters, the weirdness of Farscape, played a huge role in his approach to his Guardians of the Galaxy films. Citing it as one of his favorite science fiction shows of all time, he went so far as to include Ben Browder in the 2017 film Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. You can see him as the Sovereign Admiral in the battle scene at the beginning of the film providing counsel to Elizabeth Debicki's Aisha. SaveFarscape.com is currently available for anyone who wants to get the band back together to get the band back together. As long as there are fans of Farscape, there's a chance that it could return someday. Thanks for watching, please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are, if you're in the position to help the channel grow. If you would like early access to the videos ad-free, as well as behind the scenes features, sneak peeks at upcoming projects, and exclusive monthly podcast about the show, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy and let us know in the comments down below. If you were a fan of Farscape, were you one of the people at savefarscape.com that brought the show back again and again after being canceled? Are you interested in helping funding a new project that Greg and I are working on called Henson Babies, a show about all of Jim Henson's kids who are adults, but as kids having adventures like the Muppet Babies, Kickstarter coming soon. <laughs> Hope to see you there. <laughs> Don't put that out there. Don't put that out there. <laughs>